All right, folks, we're back. I'm Rich Folly. We're at the Los Angeles Times Festival of Books, this amazing event out in the beautiful sunshine of Southern California on the campus of USC. We're brought to you by PBS, the Great American Read series, which was just announced, 100 books just the past few days. In fact, I'm going to talk to our next guest a little bit about some of the books that meant something to her, too. But first, we're sitting with Morgan Jerkins, who's the author of This Will Be My Undoing, Living at the Intersection of Black, Female, and Feminist in White America. Nice to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, what a special thing. Right before we went on, I'm looking at the blurbs in your book, and it's a writer to be reckoned with. And I saw that Roxane Gay, who wrote the blurb, also interviewed you recently. Yes. You are now in this sort of rarefied air of, of uh, social commentator. These essays really have broken through. That must be an amazing thing for you. As a writer, you've been working for this for a long time. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty unbelievable. Um, I am very happy as a debut author that I have found my audience and people are still talking about my book <laughs> three months later. Um, it's an exhilarating experience. Yeah, you said you found your audience. It's interesting because at the beginning of the book, you say that this book is for you. You talk about it specifically. And when I first read that, I thought, well, you must mean black women. And then I thought, but then you go on to say, no, it's for anyone. It's for, it's for black women. It's for women. And it's for men mm -hmm. who understand that there's an audience there for them too. Right. Talk to me about that. Well, because, you know, growing up in America, I have read so many books by people who did not look like me. And still, I found a way to look at some of the themes in said books and find topics that resonated with me. And I think that just because I'm writing about black womanhood, black girlhood and centering myself, that doesn't mean that it's that distant, that someone who does not look like me will be like, okay, it's a little bit too foreign. So I wanted to make it clear, like even though I'm talking about a specific group in America, that doesn't mean that you should just put it to the side. Yeah, I hope not. I hope mm -hmm. that's the answer, right? I mean, if we're like reading each other's stories and understanding each other more. Absolutely. Yours, you talk about, there's a number of essays in this book. Um, I, as I was reading them, I was, I was being led down this path. I was looking for sort of summations and, and everything, but I feel like that they really weave together in a way that I was able to sort of draw my own conclusions. You didn't necessarily tell me what you wanted me to think, but I did learn a lot about you growing up. And you start off with black girlhood. Mm -hmm. And the first story in the book uh, is Monkeys Like, Monkeys like Me. I Monkeys Like You. Yeah, yep. and Monkeys Like You. And it's, um, it really talks about you growing up and sort of weaving and walking the, the tightrope between black girls and white girls in a school where you're trying to fit in and yeah. you didn't really feel like you fit in at all. Yeah, and that was one of the hardest essays to write. Um, you know, we're living in an era where we're thinking about identity politics and having pride in our background, even if we are marginalized. And to start off a book is saying that, you know, when I was 10 years old, I wanted to be a white cheerleader. I was very frightened yeah. of the perception that I would receive because of that honesty and because of learning about what it meant to exist as a black girl and not wanting to be myself at 10 years old before I even really understood the dynamics of race and gender. I think it's, it was a very uh, hard subject to tackle. Yeah, you write about the fact that on, on one side, you have these, these white girls who felt absolutely confident. You talk about their bobbing ponytails mm -hmm. and the confidence of, the, of everything that they brought with the table. They never had to think about anything, though, the depth that you had to think about it. On the other side, you have these black girls who felt like they were doing who they were, mm -hmm. and, and you didn't feel like you associated mm -hmm. with either one of them. What right. a difficult place to be in as right. a young kid. And as a matter of fact, the second half of that essay where I'm talking about being bullied and my anti-blackness or anti-black girlness, um, I wanted that to be a separate chapter. That's how I originally had it. And I wanted that chapter to be somewhere in the middle of the book. And my editor was like, this needs to be, these two experiences need to be combined. And I was afraid of that because I thought it was a little bit too severe. I always thought of if you're writing a book with a narrative arc, it needs to be like a roller coaster. You get strapped in, you check if everyone's safe, you go up the hill, you have that brief pause, and then you descend. Yeah. For me, it just felt like it was, it was too quick yeah. of, a, of a, a, an ascension and then a descension. But then when I read the book in its entirety, I realized those two Stories had to be melded together so you can understand how I was traumatized, how I internalized that trauma, and how it turned into self-hatred. Yeah. And I can't bring you out into 
the Elysian field, so to speak, of how I triumphed over that until I bring you back to those ugly moments of my life. Yeah, you talk about being feeling shame about the way you felt because you were, you felt like you were on your way to something. You, you know, you were wearing these uh, argyle sweaters and yeah. you, you know, argyle socks or whatever you think you said, and you were, you dressed differently, and yet you felt, you felt some sort of sense of superiority in your mind of some or, or you know, something similar to that, and you talk about the shame you felt about that, and that was brave to put that on in this book because you know you're going to have some backlash for some of those feelings and talking about them so openly. What if, when you were writing it, what, that must have been sort of something that was just felt like a risk of It sorts. was definitely a risk um, because I was talking about a moment where I didn't like myself and I projected that um, outward. And, you know, a lot of people ask me, well, why would your mom do all this stuff for you, make you dress up this way, tell you to talk this way for protection and because she wanted me to be as successful as possible. And... Many people of color across the world have been conditioned to assimilate um, to the, the majority, which is usually white people. And so that's what she wanted me to do to be successful and to get out of my environment and go where no other person has gone before. But also, I think writing this book was a way for me to give my shame back. I had mm -hmm. to unpack all these memories and these emotions that, yes, they were shameful, but they were valid. And what did they tell me about myself and about the world and about the community in which I was raised? So it was definitely a risk, but I had, but you know, when I endeavored to write this book, those particular memories were the ones that immediately rose to the front of my consciousness as if I summoned them. Mm -hmm. So I felt like I, I had to do it. Yeah. I wouldn't be given honor to my past selves if I just chose to ignore it. Yeah, when you think about your mother and what she was trying to do, she was trying to protect you. She was trying to bring you to this next level. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, she that had to be sort of a lonely walk at times. And I, I, I think about, do you, when did you realize what she was doing? When did it become apparent to you what your mother was trying to do for you? I think I knew in high school when she was like, I want you to wear this. I don't want you to wear, you know, urban clothes. I want you to wear this Did type of Did you ever resent clothes. that? Yes, yeah. because so many of my friends had like the new baby fat or like apple bottom jeans. And I would get it from time to time. My mother was like, I want you to dress this way. I want you to look professional at all times. You have to look the part of where you want to go. So I think from like, you know, preteen, adolescent years, I knew exactly what she was doing. Yeah. And it was always, you know, her the tone in which she would tell me this was always with like a hint of admonishment. It wasn't like jovial or anything. It was like a warning. Yeah. And you're tight with your mom now. And she's like, yeah. you, you read it in some of the other essays in the book, your mom was there for you for other things too. Mm -hmm. But does she ever talk to you about those early days when you were bullied and for the things that she was, you know, yeah. making you, wanting you to do? Yeah. I mean, my mother, well, first off, my mother was nervous before she read the book. I mean, I'm from South South Jersey. I grew up in a very tight-knit black Christian community, and she was worried that some of the things that I would divulge in the book, um, she would be able, she would be nervous yeah. to go to Sunday church service and have people ask she, her she about it. She knows you. So, yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. But then, like, three days before my book came out, she said to me, she was like, I, I couldn't put it down, and I wish I was that brave. Like, I'm finding my voice now as, I, and I'm, as I'm in my 50s. Yeah. And that made me feel so reinvigorated because I was nervous up until the release of my book. But, yeah, I mean, my mother and I, we talk more about, like, feminism now and what that means because I feel like my mother is becoming more passionate with feminist beliefs. Yeah. So that's always a good thing. Yeah, you're teaching each other something. Yeah. So you, you also you start off with black girlhood, but you move into black womanhood. Uh, and, and your sort of uh, story moves in. You go to Princeton and you're studying Japanese. I mean, two things that are going to put you out there. And you just kept pushing to those places, though, where you were probably oftentimes alone. I was talking to a cab driver the other day who spent his childhood in Japan. He talks about pulling out his childhood photos. It was just him with his, you know, afro and a bunch of mm -hmm. Japanese kids. And he said he didn't even really recognize how different he was mm -hmm. until later. Mm -hmm. But you were moving into those areas that purposefully puts you sort of yeah. in an unusual place. Right. I think for me, one of the reasons why I wanted to l learn foreign languages, one, because I'm nosy. I don't like to be in places where I don't know what people are talking about, but also because I wanted to catch people off guard all the time. I didn't want people to look at me and say, oh, well, she's a black woman. She can only speak this one language. I wanted to be able to communicate with as many people as possible and code switch in different ways and learn more about myself in the world. But yeah, I mean, when I was studying the language, I, I didn't, those languages, I didn't see many like me when I was studying J Japanese or Russian, or even when I traveled to those countries, it was definitely an eye-opening experience of what it meant to be black, what it meant to be a woman, what it meant to be a foreigner. Yeah, when you were at Princeton and you were going through this, 
was there a fierceness in you? Did you understand? Like, because you know, you, it's not like you were alone, and yet at the same time, you had to forge a path. You had to just make. You knew what you wanted. Yeah, I think when you're at a place like Princeton, like everybody wants to be the best. Luckily, I grew up in a family where my mother was like, "You're at this place. This is great." My mother, that, my mother never asked to see a report card, transcript. Yeah. Nothing. She was happy. She's like, my job is yeah, done. Yeah, she's like, I'm just happy. <laughs> I want you to be happy. Yeah. Um, and so for me, though, being at Princeton intellectually, like I felt like I soared. There was none of my ambition was ever cut off. I never ran across an advisor that said, you know what, maybe you should just divert your attention and maybe make this more narrow. They never did that. Socially was where I faltered a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So finding your voice and finding your audience, you talked about that. Right now we are sort of like in this bisected world where everybody sort of finds their people, right? And then they follow them. Um, you do have to actively reach out to find voices that are unlike your own. Mm -hmm. um, that's hard to do for a lot of people. Right now, it's so much easier to sort of settle in. Um, how did you do that when you were growing up? Where did you look for your inspiration and other voices? Well, I'll be honest. I mean, in terms of literature, just in general. Everything. Literature. Let's start there, though. I mean, in literature, I didn't read much as a kid. I mean, it was just like the Bible, maybe like Dr. Seuss and Goodnight Moon and all of those childhood classics. But I didn't really start liking to read until my senior year of high school when I was in an advanced placement class and I was allowed to choose the books that I wanted to read. And I chose Madame Bovary by Gustave Flaubert. And then I chose Lolita by Vladimir Nabokov. And then I, I just, Kept that was it. Yeah. Why? Why those two? I don't know. Like, I just was like, oh, these look very controversial. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to read it. And then that's when things started to change. So I was actually a writer before I was a reader. And that's another admission that I'm hesitant to be uh, forward about. But that's that's the truth. Well, you talked about, too, like what was the attraction to Japanese and understanding the Japanese culture, Japanese writing, okay. all of that. So Japanese culture, I found my... I had my foray into Japanese culture through many American kids, which through anime. Uh, my mother bought me this Sailor Moon DVD, uh, tape, sorry, not DVD, because that was a long time ago, taped on a whim, and I fell in love with it. But also, I particularly studied um, post-World War II Japanese literature, and that type of literature has a strong emphasis on identity, dual identities, or lack thereof, a disruption. And I love anything that has to deal with, like, personality crisis, identities, and all those sorts of things. Same thing with Russian literature, the idea of the identity crisis and madness and existentialism. I love all of that. Yeah, so now you have like these essays that are out in the world. And, and then when I think about this cover, this cover is such a strong woman. When you were writing this, did you feel that way? Did you know who you were? I mean, like obviously there's, there's strength here, but you had to like, this is an early part of your career. You're standing into this world. And like, I just look at a woman who's been around for like, you know, you look like you've been there, done that here in this photo. I, I faked it till I made it. You know, when I was on my book tour, a lot of people asked me, how did I get over the fear of writing what I wrote? And I told them I never did. I just acknowledged it. I didn't let it paralyze me. And I often think fear can become paralytical if you choose to ignore it. Um, and when I was writing the book, I never thought I was going to be on the cover of it. It was actually my parents who were like, ask your editor, you can be on the cover of the book because you should be on the cover of your book. And at that time, you know, the only other black woman I know who was on the cover of her own book, nonfiction book, was Janet Mock. So I was like, I'm not at her level, so they're not going to they're not going to say yes. But I asked my editor because I thought I had nothing to lose. And 30 minutes later, she was like, go for it. And then I was worried about how I would present myself. Would I wear braids? Would I wear my hair in an afro? Would I flatten my hair? Because hair is so politicized for black women. I didn't know what type of image to present to the world. And when I told my editor, I was like, how should I wear my hair? She was like, just go exactly as you are. Yeah. And then that was it. It's a beautiful, beautiful photo. Thank you. It really is. There's some parts in the book that are really hard to read. Um, you talk about sort of feeling inhuman at some time and, then, and this sort of desire for people to create that idea that, that the black woman is inhuman. You talk, the first one, I mean, uh, you know, human, not, there's one story that's called Human Not Black or Essay, and there's another one called Monkeys Like You, and both of those sort of explore that idea of inhumanity. And I don't know, as a, as a young person, those are like ideas and thoughts that never entered my mind. I had the freedom not to think that way or ever worry about that. I was a white male in America. You had to think about concepts and things that are so much bigger than most you know, people have to worry about. Right. How did you take that in? How do you handle that as you're growing up and sort of recognizing that truth? I mean, a lot of times when I was growing up and I felt 
these sort of interruptions, as I'll say, to my day-to-day living, I buried them because if I gave it even just a moment of deliberation, I would get sad, I would get despondent, and then it would just derail my entire day. So a lot of stuff that I reveal in the book, these were bare, buried memories that I had to excavate yeah. and show to everyone. I, I chose to suppress them to get on with my life. Because if I really took the chance to really think about why that person said what they said, even with a smile on their faces, then I would become misanthropic. Yeah, there's, there's something about the honesty of the book and some of the other, there's others out there that are sort of pushing these boundaries that wasn't, when I was growing up, I didn't see this like this. Now there's like a reward for just going there mm-hmm. and telling your story and finding the universality mm-hmm. in it and, and helping other people. Mm-hmm. But it, it seems like that's something that lately has become, um, it's hard to do and you do it really well, Thank but you. like it is something where people are just looking for that. There's a desire for people who bear mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. I, don't, I didn't have that when I was growing up. I don't remember people sort of, I, I felt like it, we were suppressed, you know, yeah. like 10 years ago. Yeah. Well, I mean, I came up in an era, in an era, 2014, where editors were hungry for essays, personal essays by young women. And that's what I'm talking about on the internet. So I, you know, got right into that. Um, many of my friends who have book deals now, it's because they were starting around that time. Um, and I think it's true. I mean, th- there's so much discussion on how much of myself do I reserve for me right. and how much of it is for public consumption. Um, and it's very interesting, I think, as a, as a black female writer, you know, sometimes I get the question of, are, you know, how do your parents think about what you feel? Um, do you feel like you've gone too far? And it's always interesting because for me, this book has been so liberating from, you know, just in terms of my journey. When people ask me that, I'm like wondering if they would ask a male a, ma- a male writer the same thing. Um, it's very interesting. Yeah, no, there's no question that I think that men don't have to deal with half the things that women writers have mm-hmm. to deal with. And, but I'm, I'm interested in the idea of like exploring though your life. When, like, when did you realize that there was something universal in your story? And then to go excavating is the word you used mm-hmm. or to pull that out for other people. When you're like, my story can, can, can be applied to other people. When did you realize that there's a confidence that comes with that? Well, I mean, what, my agent, when I got my agent back in 2015, she said to me, have you ever thought about writing an essay collection? And at that time, my knowledge of nonfiction was very scant. I thought those who wrote nonfiction were those who either led these extraordinary lives and were writing about it when they were in the 60s and 70s, or those who had like PhDs and were experts on these esoteric topics. So I was like, I don't, what do I have any business doing writing an essay collection? But one of the components of a book proposal, which you need to submit to an editor in order for them to consider acquiring said book, um, you have to write something called comp titles which ideally you list, you list like 10 books yeah. that, are both, that are both critically and commercially successful, ideally, that were released in the past five to 10 years that mm-hmm. would be like your book. Yeah, what did you pick? I picked Roxane Gay's Bad Feminist, and then I stumbled because I wanted to pick R.G. Lord's Sister Outsider, but that was published before I was even born. So then my, my agent was, okay, people of color, I mean, no, black people then. I said, okay, ta Coates Between the World and Me. And then I stumbled again, and she's like, okay, people of color. And that's when I realized that maybe there is a space for this book. Right. So, yeah, there was a lot you of... You couldn't conflict. find any others. I mean, it was hard. Yeah. Be critically and commercially successful. Right. They had mainstream appeal. And for me, I mean, if I'm going to write about black girlhood and womanhood, and I am that, I had to make myself both the, the narrator and the subject. I had to oftentimes show these experiences very viscerally and claustrophobically so that you understand that I don't live in a vacuum and also these emotions that I was feeling, like they do have a larger context, but it's also very intimate at the same time. Because otherwise I feel like if I just did a straight, you know, comprehensive review on black womanhood from this period to this period, it would lose out on so much because I'm living it right now and I'm learning so much about my identity as I go on. Yeah. Well, there is a place for you, Morgan Jerkins, and it's like out there right now. (laughs) You're connecting in such a profound way. Thank you. And I'm so glad that you found time for us. And I can't wait to see what you're going to do next. Are you want to tell us what you're going to do next? Yes. So I have two more books coming out with HarperCollins, but now it's Harper Books. Right. 
Um, the, first, the second book is called Why We Get Out. And basically what I'm doing, it's inspired by the movie Get Out. So if you saw the movie Get Out, it's basically about the ways in which black people have been dispossessed of themselves, whether it's their land or their identities or their lives. And so I'm going to be going to four different communities of the country. Um, one of them is Gullah Geechee people in South Carolina and Georgia. Another is Creole people of Louisiana. Another is black and native people of Oklahoma. And what I'm going to be doing is collecting these stories about um, their lives and the struggles to be seen as whole people. Wow, it's like anthropological. Yeah, here. You're like it's, it's like auto ethnography. Shout yeah. out to Zora Neale Hurston. Um, <laughs> and then my third project is called Call Baby. It's a novel. It's one that I started um, at the end of my time at Bennington, where I received my MFA. And basically, in African American folklore, there's a there's a belief that if a baby is born with a call, which born in the amniotic sac that that baby has amazing healing powers. Um, they might have second sight, which means they can see in the past or the future. And so I'm going to be writing about uh, black female call bearers who are in modern day Harlem. Jeez, you're busy. Yeah, very yeah. busy. I'm very excited for you. Thank you. I can't wait to see them both. Thank you. And in the meantime, thanks so much for This Will Be My Undoing. Really cool for you. Thank and so you nice so much. for you to join Thank us here. Thank you. It was an honor. 